a full didactic. Um, we've had a lot of interesting cases that have popped up over the last year that we wanted to share with you. Um, we have our distinguished faculty um, that are joining us. They'll all introduce themselves separately. Um, but uh, four cases ago in under an hour, so that makes it about 15 minutes, which means I'm about three minutes over my time. So I um, wanted to get things started. I wanted to introduce Dr. George Hanna. He'll be uh, presenting the first case uh, along with his moderator, Pat Johnson. All right, uh, thanks Dr. Kim for the introduction. I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, let me see. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, so as Dr. Kim introduced, I'm doing this with Dr. Johnson, my mentor. And uh, the specific case we'll be talking about today is one of cervical myelopathy with severe neurological progression. The patient um, of this subject is a 48-year-old, 48-year-old male with uh, who is an interventional cardiologist, quite athletic had a basketball injury 20 years prior to presentation, and his presentation was in June 2018. He was treated conservatively and did quite well with conservative management with occasional NSAIDs. He was working out in the gym a month before he came to our clinic when he initially noticed paresthesias involving his right index and middle fingers. Two weeks later, he developed paresthesias in his feet and problems with his dexterity in his right hand and upper extremity to the point that he couldn't work anymore. He took a medrol dose pack without any improvement. And um, he had no bowel or bladder incontinence. An MRI scan was obtained and he was referred for evaluation. And this is what you see here. He's a, his physical exam was really, you know, pretty much attributed to cervical pain and pain in the trapezius. And he had no Hoffman's reflex, but he did have hyperreflexia and his tandem gait was unstable. This is his MRI. Um, you can see a C4-5 he has a very large disc osteophyte complex that uh, with severe cord compression and myelomalacia at that level. Quite concerning. Sorry, again. At C5-6, you can also see um, severe stenosis there as well. Um, some foraminal stenosis on the left. And C6-7, it was really attributable to you know, severe degeneration and more foraminal stenosis and radicular symptoms. Here is a C-spine x-rays, AP and lateral. You can see um, severe disc degeneration at C4-5, um, as well as some degeneration at 5 6, six seven. loss of uh, the cervical lordosis at those segments. And uh, this are his flexion extension views without any apparent instability. So, um, CT cervical spine here demonstrating that he now has, uh, he also has foraminal disease. You can see C4, 5, 5, 6, and 6, 7. This is the left side. As well as on the right side, he had some foraminal problems, not as worse as the left. <clears throat> CT cervical spine at the different levels shows this huge calcified disc osteophyte complex at C4, 5. And, um, you know, some calcification at C5, 6, eccentric more to the left. And then this is C67 demonstrating a severe foraminal stenosis. So, you know, going back to Dr. Johnson here, you know, these are the different ways that somebody could potentially treat this disease process. Old cervical, good old cervical laminectomies without any type of um, arthrodesis, a cervical laminoplasty, cervical fusion from an anterior approach, cervical laminectomy with fusion, and a cervical disc arthroplasty. And so, you know, one of the most concerning features you can tell was at that C4-5 level and with that ventral compression, you know, it was quite concerning that you could not adequately address this disease process without an anterior approach. So the surgical procedure we decided to undertake was four, five, five, six, six, seven anterior cervical discectomies and foraminotomies with placement of Medtronic Prestige LP artificial discs. So this was um, some of the intraoperative fluoroscopy findings you can see here. This is specifically the C4-5 level. We made sure to drill down those posterior osteophytes and work and reach, reach out posteriorly past the posterior longitudinal ligament to ensure that we had complete and adequate decompression of that large you know, disc osteophyte complex that was causing cord compression. 
And then here you see us trialing at C4-5, followed by you know, making sure it was perfectly in the midline centered. And then there you could see the, the keel cuts in preparation of the end plates to insert our artificial disc. There's our artificial disc at four five and we're already trialing the next level at five six. And then here we're cutting our keels at five six followed by placement of our disc. Next, we move on to the six seven level. We're cutting our keels and in preparation for our final implant. And there is our final implant. You see restoration of the cervical lordosis, and there's that huge decompression we did at four or five to ensure that patient had excellent decompression. And then this is the AP, and patient tolerated the procedure quite well, resolution of his radicular pain, improvement of his gait, and he was discharged the following day, and he had improvement over the next several months, and he was able to return to his practice as an interventional cardiologist with his athletic endeavors. These are the post-op x-rays in clinic collection extension views. And here's just a paper talking about some of the long-term, you know, outcomes done on patients who underwent three or four level disc arthroplasties. As you know, not all discs are approved for two, two contiguous levels, but Medtronic Prestige LP is one of them. And so is MoVC. <laughs> and uh, they're not approved for, you know, three or more levels. Um, that's an off-label usage, but we've had quite a bit of experience with good outcomes without any potential patient harm in these patients. So, Dr. Johnson, I'll turn it back to you. Well, George, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, great presentation. Thank you very much, George. Uh, you know, the reason, reason I chose this case is because of a number of different reasons is that, uh, you know, one three-level arthroplasty is not supposedly any approved, you know, quote, uh, approved by insurance companies. Uh, as we know, the FDA has approved the devices. They've been studied at all of these levels. They've just never gone through any kind of clinical trials establishing what is called efficacy at a three-level. Uh, you know, as we know, most patients don't have single-level disease. A lot of them, older patients, uh, you know, that are approaching 50 or beyond will have two and sometimes three level disease. Uh, the issues about getting somebody like this approved is that we have, uh, you know, we push the insurance companies and actually have kind of an in interesting anecdotal case that there's a patient, she's a school teacher that uh, she's actually kind of a uh, advocate in many ways is that uh, she had three level problems. She didn't want an arthroplasty. She had no neck pain. She had, she had radicular, but she had a different disease process but she actually took her case to the uh, Department of Health in the state of California, had it reviewed by the Department of Health and they overturned the insurance company denial, which was an interesting way how she had her case approved. Now we've had other cases that we've done with, you know, different insurance um, carriers and work comp and different cases, but we've, we've gained a lot of experience at three level arthroplasty. I think the, uh, the other, Big issue is that uh, I think there's still a lot of controversy as to whether myelopathy is, uh, is an appropriate indication for doing arthroplasty, which obviously I, I, I feel strongly about it is that uh, a patient like this obviously has a, a big, huge disc osteophyte complex and a mixture of um, a severe myelopathy. He's an athletic guy, he's a basketball player, and, and he's actually gone back to play some basketball, although he doesn't play competitively anymore. But uh, it's an interesting case that uh, you know, he, he's done well to the point that uh, he, he came back for so few post-op visits. We don't have that many imaging studies on him, but uh, he's uh, four going on five years out and uh, he's, he's doing quite well with this. So obviously long-term follow-up is important. Uh, I think this is approaching uh, validity, having a five-year follow-up on patients like this has value, but obviously it, uh, it's, it's gonna have to stand the test of time and literally getting out there a decade, I think, which uh, some of the studies are in the, the study, I think by Matt Gournay, actually another one of his that uh, was done with Todd Landman has uh, follow-up for some of the two level cases being that far out. But anyway, I thought it would be an interesting uh, case. I'll open it up to any other questions or curious uh, about what people think about this kind of case.
Hey, Pat, hey, Pat. Pat, it's Jack. So just two quick questions. One is no concern about um, using a metal uh, implant where you cannot follow his uh, cord atrophy on progressive MRIs. And number two, on somebody who is so tight with an anterior lesion, um, any thought to do in a posterior decompression first so that you don't uh, hurt them um, digging out that uh, concrete from the front? Well, I think that if I don't want to take time and go back and the one imaging study that we showed of the uh, uh, intraoperative x-ray showed that we had milled down a pretty significant posterior part of the uh, vertebral body at C5. And we had the, uh, the curette, which is a very thin foot plate curette around it. And we took the osteophytes out. Uh, the imaging studies, we've had better luck with some of our private imaging centers have done a really good job uh, where there is a lot of artifact from the prestige discs and they have gotten to where they can image them pretty darn well. So we can see the spinal cord in some of those patients. But, you know, that's a problem with a lot of the a lot of the devices, no matter what they have in them, they, they all have enough metal that it creates artifact. And I think it comes down to the the imaging centers uh, really, I think, uh, are, are going to be able to help us out with that. And, uh, just along the same lines. So you have a patient that has the, the cord signal change. Do you think that came on acutely or do you think that these cord signal changes come on gradually over time? Because he had a relatively short history of having any symptoms. Yeah, the, the symptom pattern and well, he'd had some <laughs> symptoms and I think some radiculopathy without imaging studies you know, from prior years, we don't know the answer to that, but I would think that a signal change in the cord that big probably has some longevity that's been there a while. Those big osteophytes have been there a long time, obviously. And uh, I, I can't help but think he probably had some of those things brewing for some period of time. And then something pushed him, pushed him over the edge. I mean, he, he did have a fairly rapid uh, deterioration where the guy couldn't practice being an interventional cardiologist because he simply couldn't do the catheterizations and doing, doing stents and uh, you know the, the different fine motor maneuvers that you need to do in, in practice of his uh, his profession. And and I'm assuming that he got everything back. So although we don't have studies to prove a long term, do you think that these signal changes can ever revert, or you think they're permanent even if the patient is totally normal? No, we, we know that uh, signal changes in the spinal cord of most people like that, actually, they, they will not resolve in, the, I think, the majority of them. There have been a lot of studies that show that signal changes can come and go, but I, I don't think that uh, the signal change necessarily um, being present um, has any real effect on the outcome clinically. Is that we see those things in people that have no no symptoms residual from it, but they'll still have a permanent, you know. And I guess it's just because of the tremendous course. redundancy of yeah. the nervous system. Well, I think the nervous system will, will take quite a, quite a uh, insult like the rest of the human body does. And it's amazing how much it does. And still, yeah. As we're uh, continuing to discuss this, um, actually, Arash, since you probably need to head back <clears throat> to the org, can you uh, start loading your case and, um, a lot of a lot of as we're talking, Arash, please start it. Um, had a lot of uh, panelists questions that are coming on as, you know, is this a large calcified disc? Is this a contraindication? Uh, what about the facet joints in the back? Um, these expanded indications that you're trying to do, like, what are your thoughts? I thought this was not supposed to be done. Well, the facet joints is one that everybody brings up and uh, you know, we study them, we look at them on CT, we look at them with spec CT scanning. Uh, the fact that this patient had little or no neck pain uh, is consistent with having no real facet disease. And I think that uh, actually one of our recent lecturers, I think he underscored it and he said, you know, 80% of the loading in the spinal column is through the disc space and at least 80% of the disease happens in the disc space. And the facet joints are oftentimes relatively well preserved. There, there are certainly examples of facet disease that uh, is part of the factor. And sometimes we even will put them into people that have a collapsed disc. And, you know, they, uh, we rely on, on the uh, distraction and the offloading of facet joints. And sometimes we'll put, it, we'll put them into people that have some degree of facet disease. If Pat, I'm going to have to cut you short. Um, we got to keep going. Sorry, we got okay. three more cases. Um, the panelists can continue to ask questions. Our second case will be uh, pre uh, 
presented by our wonderful fellow, Arash Saryari. He came to us from Rush. He's now uh, graduating this year, very sad, um, going back to Illinois um, to work um, as, uh, as a faculty, I think, with Rush. Um, and uh, Dr. Hyunbae will be the moderator of this case. Hey, everybody. Hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, as Dr. Kim said, my name is Arash Sayari. I'll be presenting a case uh, with uh, Dr. Bay. Um, so this is BW. He's a 64-year-old entertainment attorney. Um, his past surgical history is significant for a prior front back anterior posterior fusion that was done in 2006, followed by uh, hardware removal and two years later. Um, and he had a pretty miserable experience with the whole surgical process, post-op pain, requiring a long course of narcotic use. Um, he did well for a number of years, about four or five years or so, he did well, and then began to notice increasing axial low back pain just above his waistline. Seems that there was no radiculopathy component and it was all axial uh, back pain and it was getting worse. He underwent... Um, numerous injections, including facet blocks, uh, without any longevity to his uh, symptomatic relief. Um, he was having increasing symptoms and it was affecting his day-to-day -day life, ADLs, ambulation. Um, he uh, was taking some oral anti-inflammatories and Tylenol without any improvement. Um, his exam was mostly normal, except for some uh, limited range of motion and having a little bit of pain with terminal flexion. Um, and, but obviously being quite debilitated by these symptoms. Um, highlighting here on the x-rays is uh, his prior fusion, which uh, seems to be intact uh, with DDD at L2-3. It seems that his L3-4 level, interestingly enough, it mostly preserved, uh, maybe just some subtle loss in disc height, but really it's end plate sclerosis, loss in disc height, anterior osteophytes that we see at L2-3 um, that we believe is uh, the culprit here. Um, did I skip over the MRI? I'm not sure. Uh, here's the MRI. Um, you can see on the axial view, uh, there's some um, disc bulge, uh, but important to highlight is that his facets seem to be intact. Um, yeah, and I would say, you know, this patient, you know, not only has back pain, but he does have a claudatory component. So, you know, he does have lumbar stenosis as well. So it's both axial back pain and a claudatory component. Yeah, and I'm just going to, there's a little video I'm just going to scroll through here. It just kind of runs through those facets there. And then. Um, it's interesting. His 3-4 is um, relatively normal. Yeah, 3-4 is relatively Yeah, a little normal. bit of loss in signal in, in the disc space, but otherwise it, it seems that uh, his symptoms are all stemming from that L2-3 level, um, which um, if I'm not mistaken, he had an epidural um, and facet blocks, but um, did not provide him any significant relief. Yeah, you can kind of see a post laminectomy kind of, you know, phenomenon. He's got scar tissue all the way in the lower lumbar spine. And, you know, this is a typical case because, you know, I mean, obviously he's got a little fluid in the facets. Uh, he's got central stenosis, lateral recess stenosis. And, you know, I think, you know, the first thought for me was, you know, hey, you know, it's a fusion, right? It's an L2-3 fusion pretty simple. It's got hardware in the back. Now, you know, in doing this, when I said a fusion for this guy, he basically, you know, had a, had a, uh, a, a panic attack because he just remembered his anterior posterior fusion from 2006. And, uh, this was, uh, this was actually done by the, uh, great Rick Delamater. And, and, uh, I'm sure I was in practice at the time. I didn't do this case, but this is when, man, this is like maximally invasive surgery. We went anterior, we went posterior, we took the iliac crest with a acetabular reamer, all right? So iliac crest with the acetabular reamer, posterior lateral fusion, um, you know, wide open, as massive as you can get. And I just remember that these patients would stay a couple of days, usually a day or two in the ICU uh, due to pain, and then they would get transferred to the floor. Um, so things have definitely changed in the last 15 years, but, um, and, uh, it's pretty fascinating. So the question is, if you're going to do L2-3 fusion, you know, would you do it isolated? I mean, or are you going to have to take this down to its previous hardware? Or do you just sacrifice the 2-3 level and just kind of hope to buy a couple of years for the 3-4 level and wait? So, yeah, I mean, just well, like uh, what do you think, Rick? You're the conservative guy. What would you do here? 
Um, you know what? <clears throat> and I think I, you, what you may be thinking, you know, he he does have some anterior spurs. I didn't look closely at the axial, but this would be somebody you might uh, consider a disc replacement. I can't see by the flexion extension how much instability. He just had a little widening of the one facet. But, you know, as you said, if you add another fusion, then this guy's 64, you know, when he's in his early 70s and he's looking at, you know, the lower thoracic all the way down. So I'd consider it, but he'd have to have good bone density and I'd have to make sure that I could get that disc out, which I think you can. So I'd consider it. So it's pretty fascinating. This patient actually, after I told him a fusion, he told me, he was like, hey, what about an artificial disc? And I was like, huh, yeah, that <laughs> may not be a bad idea. And so, I mean, you know, I'm sure you guys are blessed in Dallas as well, but obviously we're blessed with good vascular surgeons. And, you know, this guy's had a prior L4 to S1. And typically our vascular surgeons, um, as long as you skip the level, like if you had to go back and do an L3-4 disc replacement and get all the way to the anterior approach, maybe a little bit more difficult because, you know, you already had an approach at L4 to S1. Um, but our vascular surgeons usually in these kind of skip lesions will attempt and, you know, they they can get you to the two, three level. I'm not sure if you guys have the same experience, but it's kind of a revision anterior approach, but at a, a skip level, which they tell me makes it somewhat easier, although it's still a very challenging case. Hey, I think um, Jens is not on the video, but he kind of mentioned what about a decompression at L2-3? Um, and I agree with that, but then we're still potentially stuck back at the same question five years from now, uh, maybe when he presents with continued pain. Yeah, I also, I also, yeah, no, I, I think a decompression is reasonable. It's high, it's two, three. He's got a central disc. You're going to have to do a good disc decompression as well. The facets, you know, they're kind of narrow. You know, decompressing two, three, I think, and getting pretty wide is a little bit challenging. Um, but, you know, I think if you're looking at fusion, versus, uh, you know, a decompression, I, I don't know, I, I may err to a decompression and just say, hey, we'll take care of your claudication. And hey, you're going to have back pain, but you know, it's not worth it, right? It's not worth treating. Uh, I, I kind of think that that's certainly reasonable. Okay, five minutes. What do you do, Arash? All right, so we uh, ultimately decided to, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, so we ultimately decided to proceed with the uh, Disc replacement at L2-3, um, I think as Dr. Bay had alluded to, uh, you know, this is somewhat institution dependent going back in from the front as a somewhat revision. Um, so, you know, it can be dicey, but it was successfully done with our uh, approach surgeons here and the patient did well. These are his initial post-op x-rays and uh, these are his final, most recent follow-up x-rays. He's been doing well. Um, looks like the L3-4 level has been holding up. And, um, and I mean, I'll leave it there. I mean, there, don't, there was actually interesting, like I tried to do some literature review on, on skip level or non-contiguous level um, arthroplasty. And I couldn't find anything in the lumbar spine. There's a good amount of literature in the cervical spine looking at non-contiguous um, adjacent segment to basically non-contiguous non degeneration um, and how that's kind of treated from a biomechanical standpoint, looking at fusion versus arthroplasty. Um, but I think this is an area that would be in, of interest to look at further, to get a better sense of how you kind of manage these and how they do long-term. It, it's pretty fascinating. When I, when I think about this, I really, I mean, this is almost kind of an indirect decompression. And we do, I think minimally invasive surgery these days, we're doing a lot of indirect decompression for the anterior approach, whether it's anterior lateral with an X lift or with this, whether it's an A lift followed by posterior screws. And so I think something that we've learned over the past 10 years is the value of indirect decompression. And it's fascinating. This is an indirect decompression with an arthroplasty. Because you see how much height restoration that we've got. We were able to take that posterior disc bulge, very much like a, you know, an ACDF, um, and uh, really help him out with both his claudication and his back pain. And, you know, it's interesting when you look at the sagittal alignment, I mean, the guy post operative is like, you know, hey, I can stand up straight. Like, I've never been able to stand up straight before. And it actually so looks it's, better. It's, it looks like you dialed yeah, in. Yeah, no question. yeah, yeah, definitely more lower doses. You know, yeah, it's, I, dynamic. it's not I think static lower doses. I think Dell would be proud of you. It's, you made a nice case out of this, but I think the point to make is this is a center of excellence kind of case. 
you have to have the right combination of the, the approach guy and the spine guy who knows what they're doing um, to make lemonade out of this. Um, so, I, you know, you did a great job, but I don't think this is for everybody. <laughs> no, no, and, this and, is definitely an interesting case, right? And so, they, the, you know, the other comment, vascular surgeon as well. You got to have a really, really good vascular surgeon. Well, you know, Bay, you mentioned that your vascular surgeons don't necessarily like to go to the adjacent level. I've done a number where we've done four, five, and going back to three, four. You know, five, one is not. You know, you can do it from the same side, but our access surgeon, for example, she will put a kidney in before she starts to dissect. Now, the once she gets down there, because if you expose, you know, the wrong level, you're not getting back there. So, and I'm, I'm sure your guys are just as good as our guys and gals that we have here, but knock on wood, I've not had a bailout on an adjacent level that our access surgeons have done. I can't speak to anybody else's. Oh, so that's, that's that pretty was, interesting. That was so, a beautiful thing. Rick, you're saying that you've gone back and done a artificial disc replacement at L3-4 or an adjacent level when somebody has been there before at, let's say, 4-5. You're able to get to the 3-4 level with the full anterior approach. If, if we've done the approach at 4-5, if wow. I'm a surgeon has. Now, I can't say for somebody else's, although we had done some 4-5s with somebody that had an L5-S1, and you have to look at the clips, and it's it's one of those deals where you go and you say to the patient, we may not get there, but knock on wood, we've not had a bailout. Right. No, that's, that's, but that's it, takes, it takes a great access surgeon. It's not, not my expertise yeah. or Jack's. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's like we have the easy job. I know, we do. <laughs> um, on that note, Julie, the case, uh, sorry to easy. pause the discussion. Julie, uh, can you start loading your uh, talk with Dr. Barron as we continue to discuss but it, isn't it amazing how we've changed our whole thought process? Because if you would have done a fusion of two, three, and they say, well, what about the skip level? Well, we should include that. And then he's from two to the sacrum. That's right. That's right. 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 It's, and it's just like, you know, when are we going to go T10 the pelvis? Right. It's just, you know, it's fascinating. But I, I, I do feel like, you know, I've done a lot of collapse disc at, at five, one and, um, and like at these levels, it's, it's always amazing how much lower doses that you're able to get out of an artificial disc, which I think is fascinating. And it's dynamic, you know, I, and I think it's more functional from sit to stand. I think when you have lower doses that's actually able to accommodate, you know, I think going from sitting to standing, it, it may be more beneficial than a fusion that's giving you the lower doses. Okay, um, our next case, um, our chief resident, Dr. Julie Chan in neurosurgery, um, we were able to get her. She is uh, going into spine. She's doing her fellowship uh, next year or uh, next year at um, Leahy Clinic. Um, uh, and she wanted to kind of present a paper that Dr. Barron presented or uh, published on a very interesting complication related to lumbar disc arthroplasty. So take the stage, Julie. Thanks, Dr. Kim. Can you guys see the proper screen, the regular screen, not the presenter? Yep, it's all right. uh, we can okay. see it. It's great. Perfect. Okay. So thanks so much. Um, so this is a case uh, with Dr. Barron, as Dr. Kim mentioned, and a couple other colleagues. Julie, we, are, we do have presenter mode. Oh, oh you do. Let me, yeah. let me switch. Can you put okay. it in full screen mode? I think it's in presenter Yeah, mode. it's because I have two monitors. Um, click, click on it. Double click on it. On this one? Or display settings up there. Uh, let's see. On the upper left. Uh, it's upper, I think, right. Click from display me. settings there. Display settings. Just it says show taskbar display settings. Yes. And show. So click that little carrot on display settings. Next one over. Next one. Uh, oh, this one? This one. Display settings. And there's a little yeah. carrot. There you go. There Does that work? There we go. Yep. That's better? Yep. yep. Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so post-operative CSF leak uh, after a lumbar total disc replacement, a diagnostic and management challenge. Um, so this was actually published in 2020 with World Neurosurgery with some of our other colleagues, my co-residents, the spine fellow at the time, um, and one of my neurosurgery attendings, Dr. Shevink, who is actually one of the world's leading experts in CSF leak repair. So this is a 25 gentleman, 25 year old gentleman. He had complaints of low back pain as well as tingling into his low back as well as his butt. Um, he didn't have any radiculopathy, no other bowel and bladder changes, and no other associated symptoms. Just this eight out of ten back pain with the paresthesias into the low back. 
Um, he actually had this pain for nine years and he tried a lot of conservative management, including PT, chiropractic care, uh, NSAIDs, as well as ESIs. And none of that really relieved his back pain for any appreciable amount of time. Um, the, uh, the symptoms were worse with activity, sitting, and ice baths were the only thing that seemed to help. He didn't really have any significant uh, past history, just depression, ADHD. He, he did have a history of opiate abuse, um, but was no longer abusing them at the time, and he was a construction worker. So post uh, preoperative films here. Um, so AP lateral x-rays, you can see that there's good, um, pretty significant amount of L5 S1 disc degeneration, no significant coronal um, deformity and no slip, no spondylolisthesis. MRI pre-op re-demonstrates that L5 S1 disc degeneration, which is really isolated to that disc level. All his other discs looks, look pretty good and consistent with his age. So as I mentioned, isolated L5 S1 disc degen, and we recommended an L5 S1 TDR and here it is. So interoperatively, some films looks good. Nice midline alignment, um, nice AP um, lateral alignment as well, anterior posterior alignment. Postoperatively, he did great. Immediately in the PACU, five out of five strength throughout, normal sensation. Uh, the next day, post-up day one, his pain was controlled. Just a little mild nausea, but he was able to get up with PT. And but he did have some orthostatic headaches. Um, whenever he was upright, he was getting these severe headaches, photophobia. Um, he did, they did improve being in the recumbent position, um, but he also developed this new left foot numbness. So, you know, based on these orthostatic headaches, we were concerned for CSF leak, although we didn't see any appreciable CSF leak in the, during the case. We did get an MRI L-spine and the MRI L-spine was negative for any leak that we could appreciate. Um, but then his headaches did get better on Fioraset, so he went home post-op day three. Um, post up day nine, he came back. So a little bit over a week after surgery, he came back. His incision was healing nicely. Um, his headaches seemed to get better. And he just had some headaches when he was laughing and that foot numbness was also getting better. But then 10 days after that, so now about two to three weeks post-op, he had severe headaches again. Now neck pain, low back pain, nausea. Um, we got a CTAP and it did have this nine by four centimeter. So pretty significant fluid collection that was adjacent to the left psoas. Um, and we also got an MRI that demonstrated that same large fluid collection you can see here with the arrow. So given the concern for CSF leak, we put in a lumbar drain. You can see it's here at the L34 uh, interspinous disc space. And with that lumbar drain, we actually injected contrast into it uh, to further see if we could see where the leak was coming from. Um, and here you can see on that CT Milo in the lower right image, you see a, a, some contrast extra in the anterior left space. So we had the lumbar drain in, left it for four days and his headache got better. Seems like the leak resolved. Um, but then <laughs> the saga continues. Nine days after he left the hospital from that lumbar drainage, he got those same postural orthostatic headaches, photophobia again. So then we opted for, you know, a little bit more, all right, lumbar drain didn't work. Let's try an epidural blood patch. Um, his symptoms went away again, epidural blood patch, next day went home, um, which is just an image showing uh, the intraoperative or IR films for the blood patch. Implant still looks like it's in good location, not too far posterior. So, you know, the question is in definitive management. So he actually came back um, again, um, even after the lumbar drain placement, after the epidural blood patch, even though each time his symptoms seemed to get better, he came back again with these postural headaches. So, you know, at this point, you know, even though these, you know, less invasive measures seem to work, it certainly wasn't definitive. So we made the decision to intervene with primary repair. Um, the first, uh, the thought was to go transdural. So go from a posterior approach, transdural, um, and repair, um, the leak. And this is something we actually do quite often at our institution with Dr. Sheeving. We repair, um, spontaneous, uh, ventral dural defects for intracranial, uh, spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Um, so we, so we did that. Um, we did the, our standard repair for this type of ventral leak where we place a muscle patch, um, like in an hourglass configuration at the ventral tear, and then seal that in place with the seal. 
Julie, can you show us, can you go back to that picture? What exactly sorry. is that? So, uh, sorry, I apologize. So this image is actually showing you a picture of that ventral tear. So that where that arrow is, that is the leak. And that's, this is pretty classic for what we see in, in our CSF leak repairs. You see this ventral hole, um, you know, and in this case, we're obviously quite low, we're near the nerve roots, but even when we see this in the thoracic spine, you mobilize the cord over and this is exactly what you see, uh, certainly well-defined. And so through that ventral tear is where we place a muscle patch through it um, in this, what we call hourglass configuration, such that some muscle is outside, um, ventrally outside of the dura, and then some remains inside the thecal sac. And then we fix that in place with to seal. Hey, Julie. TK, uh, Terrence, if I may say, because this is my, uh case, what you're looking at here, the rootlets are all displaced to the side and the very top, I think you're seeing the edge of some rootlets, but literally this is a, a similar approach to like when I do meningiomas or ependymomas, it's, I'm literally going through the dura to the hole on the other side. Wow. And wow. Eli, Eli, how do you think you was got it? Was it a vertical cut? Was it a vertical we, 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 so we, Yes, yeah, we always we're going to discuss it in a little bit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So after this repair, transdural, um, we kept him uh, flat for 48 hours, mobilized him, did great again. After four days, um, after this posterior transdural repair, um, he was discharged. Uh, but the saga continues oh, no. again. <laughs> he still had postural headaches. We got this repeat CT Milo, and he still had this collect fluid collection at the L51 disc space tracking along in the same place again on that left psoas. Um, so now, you know, we've done lumbar drain, blood patching. We even gone posterior and, you know, repaired that leak like we've done a number of times and he still has a leak. So at this point, it's kind of like, I think what we were just talking about with Arash's case, going in at the same place, you know, where we've been before. Um, and at this point, we're about um, a month out, right? So going in, do we go in? Well, I think we kind of have no choice, right? We went in posteriorly multiple times. Now we have to go through the font. Um, and what do we do? You know, are we going to replace that uh, arthroplasty? Are we going to, you know, can we go around it? Do we have to remove it? And then what do we put back in? Another TDR or do we just go ahead and fuse him? But this is a 25 year old guy, right? With um, isolated L5S1. So we went interiorly. Um, we do have, as you mentioned, great vascular surgeons. Uh, we decided to go contralateral to the initial um, retroperitoneal approach. I think the first time was right, and then we went left. Um, we removed the TDR um, without injury, vascular injury, um, cut down. Um, so basically cut through the core of the dome, cut through that with the drill, and then use osteotomes to pry out that um, the the end plates from the bony end plates and get that keel out. Um, after that, um, let's see, is that it? Yeah. So after that, um, so there was um, we did see that ventral epidural fluid collection. Um, it was certainly in continuity with the 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 disc space, um, and you could actually appreciate that tear, which we saw from the posterior transdural uh, viewpoint as well. Um, not only that, but there seemed to be an osteophyte that was in contact with a thecal sac, you know, per, um, perhaps that was part of the issue that happened during surgery and or that's why the CSF leak was persistent. There was, you know, this osteophyte in that same area. So we took down that bony spicule as well um, during surgery. It was primarily repaired. We only a dura repair over the ventral leak as well as the kind of padded it with dura gen laterally on both sides and then further reinforce it with to seal um, over the whole construct. We also performed Valsalva. There wasn't any evidence of CSF egress after that repair. Amazing. Three minutes for discussion, guys. Let's, uh, everyone, let's kind of come in and chime in, please. So I, I have a question here. Is I'm missing something? Eli, please explain to me because I'm not sure why you can't fix a leak like this from the back. We did. The, the problem is every time I took a suture ventrally, I would hit the polyethylene core. The properties of a, po a disc replacement when it's very back in the spinal canal with a very, mm -hmm. very ventral hole didn't let me put a needle in there because it would literally hit the uh, core 
and there was a, actually a spit of bone that didn't let me cinch down a knot. It would literally deflect the metal. So we put it in there, but I, I thought the knot, et cetera, wasn't optimal. And he leaked again. I mean, Chevenk tried to repair it too. We then, uh, as a result, basically wound up eventually taking the patient back. And I converted him with Jason Cuellar to an active L, which had a completely different profile after I repaired the Dura from the front with a scope. And he actually wound up doing quite well. But I thought I was like a crazy man for having this complication. And since I've published this paper, every year I'm getting calls from attorneys and surgeons about CSF leaks after ADR. So they do exist in the community. No, I, I understand, I understand like, that. But this you is, have to take some more bone down to, to repair the, the CSF leak? Like when you took the artificial disc out, did you, did you have to take some of the posterior end plate? I took a little bit of bone out, but not that much. I'm actually surprised that Shavink's, Shavink's repair did not work. So mm -hmm. I, I oh, missed. How did, so this is a cult. There's no. I mean, how do you think you got it? Or it was. There I think I remember at surgery something happening. I remember I drilled down the end plates, made them a little bit more flat, and I remember it started to bleed more. But I never saw any CSF, and I looked around, and it stopped with a little bit of flow seal. So I in my head, assumed that I didn't have a leak. But now, anytime I get brisk or bleeding with ADRs or anything, I'm so careful to look, maybe I have a leak that I don't know about. But I'm not surprised though, if it continued to leak with the bony spicule, because when we do our ventral repairs, there's almost always a bony component on the posterior side of the vertebral body that we, we often take down as well. And that's kind of one way you're able to localize where those leaks are. So I wouldn't be surprised if that, that transdural repair didn't work without taking that down. Uh, uh, that's Julie, my point, uh, Julie. Hold on, a pause. Ch uh, Julie, if you can uh, stop your presenter mode. Uh, yeah. Ken, if you can start loading since it's uh, 5.45 and please continue on with the discussion. Well, that, that's part of my, my point that Julie just pointed out is that you know we fixed lots of CSF leaks. In fact, I've just had one that we actually put a sling around the spinal cord, not, not the lumbar spine where you're dealing with the cauda equina. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can almost always fix these from the back. And if you have a ventral bony spicule, that's the basis of a lot of these spontaneous CSF leaks. And so- uh, Pat, I, I think one difference though, is when I, I've done these, those kinds of cases too, mm -hmm. they're usually cases like, for example, if I have screws, I take down a facet, I can angle all sorts of things. Here, I want it to be minimally destructive with my laminectomy and not get into the facet because he had an ADR. So I was looking straight down the midline, almost like an approach again for a schwannoma without going lateral at all. In fact, I kept the muscle on the facet capsule. Right. And I'm just wondering if that, boxed me in angle wise for all our tools. Okay, so um, continue on with uh, more questions to the chat. Our last uh, presenters, uh, Dr. Ken Illingworth, um, uh, he's gonna be presenting this pediatric scoliosis case to us. Ken and, and Dave Skaggs, who just joined us, welcome Dave, um, uh, came to us I think two years ago now, um, and they've just been a tour de force in the uh, pediatric spine world for our spine center. Every time they hold a conference, all, all us adult guys are like, whoa, what did you do? <laughs> so welcome guys and uh, please, this, the floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? So uh, yeah, thumbs up. Yes. Perfect, so uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I, I'm, I'm laughing because every time I join an adult spine meeting, I say the exact same thing. And uh, Bay was just uh, commenting on his uh, uh, archaic previous surgeries where they're maximally invasive, which is exactly what I did yesterday in my T2 to pelvis <laughs> for a muscular kid with iliac crest bone graft, but I didn't use an acetabular reamer. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about a case on pediatric scoliosis, and uh, Dr. Skaggs is also available. He'll, he'll comment on it as well. So let me see here. No disclosures. All right. So LS, she's a 12-year-old female. Uh, she's one month status post menarche. Anytime we talk about pediatrics and adolescents, or at least scoliosis, we're always interested in how much growth they have remaining. She presents today with her parents. She state they're adamant. They state that six months ago, her back was totally normal. And then in the last six months, it's just gone out of control, literally to the point where they moved from Mexico to Los Angeles because her back was getting so bad. And they, they say she had no deformity before. In addition to that, she has some vague pain at night. 
okay? And then she also complains of some significant pain with sneezing, okay? That's some atypical pain. So that's lumbar pain with sneezing. All right, here's her initial presenting x-rays. So she's got a, a right thoracic scoliosis. This is approximately 65 degrees, all right? Uh, there is some appropriate vertebral rotation here, but we can see on the lateral view, she does have some maintenance of her thoracic kyphosis. Uh, as we know, a uh, typical uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis or typical scoliosis in this population is a lordotic event. Uh, so, but she does have a little bit of maintenance of her thoracic scoliosis. So just a couple of the uh, learning points. So for her, she's got a couple red flags in terms of uh, indicating that I want to get a, a further advanced imaging, an MRI of the spine to rule out neural axis abnormalities. Um, indications for that are left thoracic curve. She has a right thoracic curve and the actual location is pretty typical, but left thoracic curves, uh, night pain, lack of vertebral rotation, uh, as well as maintenance of thoracic kyphosis. And in addition to uh, atypical pain, as well as any, any patient that presents with any atypical neurological findings on examination. This is just an example of a, of a different patient, not this particular patient, who had a little bit of atypical scoliosis, maintenance of thoracic kyphosis here, really no vertebral body rotation whatsoever. Um, and she got a screening MRI, found they have a Chiari malformation with the syrinx. So this patient underwent a uh, full uh, cervical thoracic and lumbar MRI, uh, and she was found to have this intradural lesion at L4, uh, we can see this over here on the left and right side. Here's a, uh, whoop, sorry about that. Here's a, uh, a T1 sequence over here. Again, confirming that she's got this isolated lesion uh, at the L4, intradural lesion at L4. Now there's probably lots of neurosurgeons on the call can probably give whole lectures on intradural lesions. I certainly can't. And so for her, she gets sent to my uh, neurosurgery co colleagues, pediatric neurosurgeons, and again, on the MRI, she had a 13 millimeter intradural nodule at L4. So sent to the neurosurgery team, they, they elected to do a laminectomy um, as well as a gross total resection and on pathology diagnosed with a grade one myxopapillary and, and ependymoma. She did very well after that procedure. Um, and then she presented about six, six months later after all of her uh, neurosurgical teams and oncology team says that she was doing well, but continued to have progressive deformity for the family. And we can see this is her physical examination. Again, you can see her scar down here at the bottom and the lumbar spine consistent with her surgery. And you can see this kind of big right thoracic curve again here. She's got some significant scapular asymmetry protrusion of the right scapula here, uh, asymmetry of the waistline on them. And then on her Adams Ford Ventus, you can see she's got a fairly uh, prominent right rib prominence there secondary to her axial rotation. So now here's her x-rays about six months-ish later. All right, so her curve is now progressed from essentially 65 degrees uh, now to 100 degrees, right? Her pre is atypical pain subsequently resolved, uh, but she started to have some, some pain over on the right side where she had that large rib prominence over here. And then again, you can see she has even more pronounced thoracic kyphosis as her curve began to progress. All right, the, uh, the, the kicker here is, is that anytime you see these kids, you say, okay, it's, you, know, you need surgery, you got a severe curve, you're 100 degrees, and then you start filling out the paperwork, and this has happened to me multiple times, is you get a bonus, and, and, they, and they throw in there that they're Jehovah's Witness, right? And that didn't come up really much when uh, they underwent the lumbar laminectomy and the intradural excision. But when you're talking about a large surgical procedure to correct 100 degree severe uh, scoliosis, certainly that came up when the blood consent was about to be signed. And so that, that leaves a little bit of a predicament when you're dealing with such a big curve and planning for a big operation wherein, you know, if they're not a Jehovah's Witness, we're planning for multiple posterior column osteotomies possibly you know, needing a stage procedure if they have intraoptor intra neuromonitoring changes. So it certainly changes a lot about the approach uh, to surgery from my perspective. We do halo gravity traction a lot in kids, okay? It's one of my favorite thing to do. This is, it's, such a, it's such a barbaric technique. It's such a great technique, which allows for severe correction of, of severe deformities in kids. 
you know, there's been lots of papers published on it. This is just one from uh, when uh, Lenke and his group were at St. Louis and basically they found that over 35% of correction can be expected with about three to four weeks of traction and they tolerated it fairly well. This has also been found in the adult population as well in, in multiple papers, including this one from 2020. Uh, this was that particular patient. You can see the amount of correction you can get in four weeks for some of these really severe curvatures. Uh, Dr. Skaggs published this paper looking at complication rates in kids. Um, it is a, what I tell my residents and fellow, it is certainly a daily labor of love. Um, there's certainly high risk of complications such as pin site infections, neurological complications such as cranial nerve palsies and extremity weakness. But these are often relieved with decreasing weight uh, in terms of your halo gravity traction setup. This is a, the x-rays of our patient. You can see over on the left, that's our 100 degree curve and then x-rays at one week, two weeks, and three weeks. So after three weeks of halo gravity traction, we've taken this severe curve uh, where we're gonna do lots and lots of osteotomies if she's not a Jehovah's Witness and we've essentially turned it into a, a 50 degree pretty chip shot case. Um, and so she had excellent correction. But when you have these cases, you also wanna get your buddies involved, all right? And there's good studies out there that say you can, when you have a dual surgeon approach for these cases, you can reduce risk of allergenic transfusion uh, and which is really important, obviously, in a Jehovah's Witness. So Dr. Skaggs assisted me on this case um, in order to get it done in a timely fashion. This was her post-operative radiographs. She got a T2 to L2 posterior spinal fusion instrumentation, no osteotomies, and no transfusion. Uh, this was just her surgical time. So uh, we, we started the surgery at, at 940, and we finished the, uh, we began to close an hour and 38 minutes later for a T2 to L2 fusion. So Get your favorite uh, efficient surgeon. Dr. Skaggs is very efficient and fast. Get your efficient surgeon for when you're doing these cases. Uh, and she had a very low EBL of 200. And here's her pre-op and um, post-op uh, in the middle of the hematocrit. Again, didn't require transfusion. Here's her x-rays at one year. She's maintained good, really good coronal and sagittal balance. Um, and the, her, her bottom lumbar curve there has not progressed at all in a year. So continue to monitor that over time. Dr. Skaggs, do you have any comments on this case? If you were there, an active participant. Uh, that was a good judgment, a lot of good teaching points. If there's abnormal pain, get an MRI. Would you mind showing the, po the post-op again? Yeah. You know, when you have a kid like this, where it's really important not to bleed too much, not to be too long on the table, if you don't get every pedicle with a screw, that's fine, just move on. You, know, you can see there's empty holes there and then not probably any other reason. And then it took more than 30 seconds to get a screw in. So go to the next one. Ken, um, and Dave, what's your uh, decision for uh, LIV? Yeah, so that's a, that's a, that's a really good uh, uh, point there. I think if you look over here at her, her, her um, preoperative x-rays, right, five, four, three, this kid's getting about getting to an L3 fusion, right? Um, her traction x-rays, though, at the end of traction looked so good. And that L2 vertebrae uh, was fairly neutral or pretty close to neutral. There wasn't too much of rotation. Uh, we decided to, to just go to L2. And the other fact that she had previous uh, laminectomy and work done at the L4 partial L3 junction. So we wanted to stay out of that area down below. So. You can make an argument, certainly, to go into L3 on her. I don't think that would have been the wrong thing to do. Luckily for us, she's at least held up here over the last year without any progression of that lumbar curve. The LIV is, is pretty uh, is pretty level, uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful that it will last up a lot over time. The coronal and sagittal balance is very good. So the uh, halo gravity traction actually saved the level as well in your decision making. It certainly saved it in the decision making, right? Only <laughs> lower or not, but you know, and, and going lower, especially on this kid, is is just more surgical time, and you know, it's another opportunity to to get into some bleeding, and uh, um, you know, we, we felt that going to L two would have provided the you know the LIV that we needed for hopefully long term health, and she, thankfully she's done very well, and we could 
you know, avoid a, a transfusion in her, which is obviously the family's, uh, one of the family's main goals in terms of uh, before going to surgery. Ken, some of the panelists, I'm sorry, some of the chat questions that are coming up, which you may not be able to see, um, so the audience wants to know uh, rates of neurologic complications and excellent correction. Do you perform additional ponties at the apex to correct the deformity? Not in a kid who's got, uh, not a kid who refuses the blood transfusion. and I don't do uh, osteotomies. If that kid, if, if we did, if we did the surgery over here without, with not being a Jehovah's Witness, absolutely. I'm doing, I'm doing. Um, uh, several pon posterior column ponte osteotomies in order to help with deformity correction, uh, both the coronal sagittal as well as axial correction. But when you're talking about trying to preserve um, and limit blood loss, the reason to do the traction, the reason we wanted to get her over here was to avoid doing osteotomies. It's a slow correction over time. So the rate of neurological uh, complications when you're talking about a 50 degree curve is obviously very low. When you're talking about doing a hundred degree curve in one setting, the, the, the chance of having some neuromonitoring changes are high. And not necessarily neuro, uh, neurological consequence, clinical consequence, but neuromonitoring alerts when you're doing an acute, acute correction are high. If this, if this kid was not Jehovah Witness, one of the things that we consider in a curve over a hundred degrees is a temporary rod. We'd have three upgoing rib hooks maybe around T4, 5, 6, two pedicle screws, maybe around L1, L2, and literally just stretch the hell out of it. And when we do that, we lose signals about 37% of the time is our series. Then you just back off the traction, signals come back, then you're kind of done for the week. You come back a week later and you know kind of let the uh, blood flow to the spinal cord re-equilibrate. Um, so I think that Ken showed excellent judgment here, not trying to do this heroically. And I think that the traction really allowed this to be safe, not only neurologically, but also from a bleeding standpoint. Okay, um, so uh, impressively, we started a little bit late, um, but we finished right on time. I wanted to thank again, um, uh, everyone for joining us, especially our speakers, our moderators. Um, our fellow Arash, uh, Rick, Jack, uh, Jens, uh, and the rest of the SSF uh, community. And to uh, everyone out there nationally, globally, some of our uh, attendees from Brazil uh, that gave a little shout out out there. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, Jack, Rick, do you want to say anything else? No, as usual, you guys did a great job, great cases, and uh, too bad we didn't have more time for discussion. That was yeah. super, guys. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thanks, the Seattle Science Foundation. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Great, Great job. conference. Great conference, everybody. Have a like good that. evening. Thanks for moderating, TK. Thank you. Absolutely. Great job, TK. Bye, guys. It was Bye. great to see you and meet you. Bye. Dr. Bay, good to see you. You too. <laughs> Bye, Dr. J.